Yeah. James. Good morning. We'll show this. Started. Hmm. Morning, I'll officially call to order the annual Multnomah County Math Library. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I don't have one. <laughs> The TSBC is a community oversight commission established by the organization years ago. The commission oversees the budgets of all TSBC member taxing districts and annually conducts a thorough budget review and presentation process. Additionally, the TSBC holds public hearings to engage with district leadership and provide additional opportunities for budget adoption. I'll now ask my fellow commissioners and the staff to themselves and state if they have Down here, I need a booster seat or something so I can see you all. You've added this new screen here since last year or whenever we met. Uh, my name is Mark Wobold. This is my sixth year with the uh, TSCC, and uh, I just retired in June of last year, so uh, that's new for me. But um, during my career, I was in higher ed and uh, retired as the senior policy analyst uh, at Portland State University, and I have no perceived or real conflicts of interest with the district. Good morning. I'm Margot Norton. Uh, I have been on the TSCC. This is my eighth and final year because I'm term limited. Um, uh, in my professional life, I was a government, government finance officer and I retired a number of years ago um, as the CFO at Metro. Um, and I also have no conflicts of interest with the district. Good morning, everyone. I'm James Austin. Uh, microphone, please. Sorry. So, okay, perfect. <laughs> Flipped in my mind. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. James Offsing, he, him. I'm the vice chair of the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. And like Margot, this is my eighth and final year, but no senioritis. I've been very focused on <laughs> Multnomah County budget. Um, when I'm not doing this, I work at OHSU in IT. And I don't have any business relationship that could be um, perceived as a conflict of interest with the district. Good morning. My name is Matt Donahue, uh, second year on TSCC. When I'm not here at the TSCC, I'm a public finance banker and financial advisor for DA Davidson, and I have no conflicts with the county. I'm Allegra Wilhite, and I'm the executive director with TSCC. Morning, everyone. My name is Harmony Quiros. Like I said, this is my fourth year with TSCC. My second is chair. Uh, I started my career as a teacher and currently work in K-12 science curriculum and assessment. Uh, I have two small kids um, and I have no conflict of interest with the district. Uh, chair Peterson, would you uh, introduce yourselves and the other uh, anyone else that you'd like to this morning? Yes, thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. I am Jessica Vega Peterson, Multnomah County Chair. She, her pronouns. It is a pleasure to be here. I've been here, I think, seven times before this, but this is the first time in this role, so this is new and different. Um, and I'd invite my uh, board to go ahead and introduce themselves. Commissioner Stegman, do you want to start? Is this on? It is. Yes. It's so nice to be on this side. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lori Stegman. I'm the Multnomah County Commissioner representing much of East Multnomah County, which includes part of Southeast Portland at about Southeast 148th and extends all the way up to the Hood River County line. So part of Portland, all of Gresham, Fairview, Droughtdale, Wood Village, uh, and the unincorporated areas. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diane Rosenbaum, currently representing District 3 on the County Commission. And this is my first time and probably only time uh, doing this. So I'm delighted to be here. The district I'm representing uh, extends from where Commissioner Stegman's district uh, leaves off 
politics in most of Southeast Portland. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sushila Jayapal. I use she, her pronouns. I represent District 2, which is north, northeast, and part of East Portland. It's everything north of I-84, um, all the way over to northeast 148th. And then there's a little dip down below I-84 in the North Tabor neighborhood. It's great to see you and good to be here. Good morning, uh, Sharon Myron here. I represent District 1, which is all of the county west of the Willamette River and then inner southeast, uh, actually everything south of I-84 out to about southeast 33rd. It's great to see all of you in person. I know, it's nice to be back in the routine of things. Um, I will now call on any members of the public who would like to speak. Each person is limited to three minutes of public comment and we'll let you know when you're nearing the end of your time. Allegra, do we have anybody signed up for public comment this morning? No, we do not. Okay, great. Then I think we'll just dive in. Uh, James, I believe you have the first question. Thank you. Um, so. Oh, yes. Again, I don't have script. I'm winging it. Uh, do you want to take a moment to introduce your budget or anything before we dive into our discussion? Yeah, I have very brief introductory great. remarks That's and great. we can get right to the questions. I did want to uh, mention we do have. Um, Christian Elkin and Jeff Renfo um, from our budget team here. We also have um, various members from the departments in case there's a, a question or a follow-up that um, the board can't answer. We'll make sure that we get an answer for you. Um, so during the pandemic, it became very cliched to describe each new development as unprecedented. But COVID-19 created a variety of challenges in our budgeting and decision-making process that has required research on arcane aspects of Oregon budget law and creative problem solving. Throughout this process, staff in the Central Budget Office has praised the TSCC staff for answering questions, providing feedback, and being a partner in figuring out how to do new and challenging stuff while meeting all of the statutory requirements. I want to thank Allegra and Tooney for being partners as we work through all of these unprecedented situations. Well, that's a wonderful, glowing introduction. Thank you. Um, so, Chair Vega Peterson, congratulations on your first uh, budget as chair. Um, we're wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the kind of challenges and the pride points of putting together your first budget. Absolutely. So, yeah, the 2024 Multnomah County Executive Budget is the first budget created by administration and a year of transition for both the county and for our communities. We're emerging from years of hardship, organizational restructuring, investment and constraint brought on by the pandemic to turn an important corner and take forward the lessons we've learned and the things we've accomplished despite historic challenges. As a community, we're pulling together the worst devastations or following the worst devastations of the pandemic. We're reckoning with racial and social injustice and wrestling with the impacts of homelessness and a lack of affordable housing, community violence, climate change, and economic inequality. Yet I know that a just recovery is possible, especially as we lean into our ability to grow together, to work more closely and effectively, and build unlikely but fruitful partnerships. Creating this year's budget did include significant challenges, the first of which was coming into the budget process midstream. My team and I have used our first months to deepen our understanding of the county's departments, engage with community and community, the community advisory budget committees, and thoughtfully consider investments needed to sustain our communities with dwindling federal ARP dollars. The era of additional funding through ARP, which in most cases fueled programs that were important to our community, is sunsetting. We looked closely at the program offers funded by the ARP dollars, bringing some into the general fund, funding some with more limited ARP dollars, and decreasing funding for some. I want to emphasize that this budget is not built in a silo, but in concert with the many other jurisdictional and community partners who share these investments. This year's budget required us to account for uncertain funding at both the state and local levels. With regard to state funding, declining rental assistance funds and uncertainty around assistance with community corrections required us to make sure our funding for those needs, both important to continuing to prioritize the safety net Multnomah County deserves, required that we made strategic choices. With regard to local jurisdictional partnerships, continuing uncertainty in our relationship with the City of Portland around the Joint Office of Homeless Services, in which the future of our partnership in that office and the funding that goes along with that is constantly in question, is an ongoing challenge. I am hopeful in the renewed partnership with the City and the steps that they're taking actually this morning to continue our work together. That being said, our investments today and in the future do consider how to support the county's work in the area of housing and houselessness without these funds. 
When I look at the issues and crises that have already been brought before us in this first in the first days of my administration, I am confident that this budget positions us well to respond effectively and equitably, and that's what I'm most proud of. It represents a desire to take challenges head on across many critical areas, especially through careful stewardship of SHS dollars, increased investments in and accountability for Multnomah County Animal Services, supporting for for operating the BHRC, the Behavioral Health Resource Center, developing the Behavioral Health Emergency Coordination Network, Beacon, and the stabilization and modernization of county workforce and services. We are supporting a community working together to re working to remember how to be together again, meeting each other out for a meal or a gathering in the park or community center, sometimes for the first time in years. And this budget was built to reflect our foundational values at Multnomah County and the way we bring those values into relationship with the community as the safety net that helps people not just meet their basic needs, but to live, rise, and thrive. Thank you, Chair. Um, heard a number of things in there that I think we'll be diving into further and in, in more details and other questions. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with preschool for all. Uh, we were excited to see that the uh, preschool for all slots exceeded the initial goal for this year. Uh, nevertheless, we noticed that the preschool for all fund is carrying over a considerable amount of money to fiscal year 24. Can you talk to us a little bit about the obstacles there are to getting that money out the door and what your estimate is for how long it will take to significantly spend down those dollars? Yes, and I'll take that question. So to center racial equity and build a robust mixed delivery implementation timeline invests in system supports as the program grows. The intentional wrap up, ramp up of Preschool for All has been a part of the plan from the very beginning. Implementing publicly funded preschool too quickly can have unintended consequences, including reducing the availability of infant and toddler slots throughout the child care system and funneling investments only into large organizations. A quick expansion can leave behind small, diverse providers who've never had the opportunity for public investment or even put these small preschool programs out of business. The approach we're taking is one that builds capacity and allows time for culturally and linguistically diverse providers to strengthen and expand their businesses as the system matures. Money saved in the early years of implementation has a specific and designated purpose that we'll call revenue smoothing. As implementation progresses, we anticipate expenditures to outpace revenue. Based on current estimates, there will be a 10-year period during FY 29 through um, FY 2029 to 2038 when costs are higher than revenues, which is right as the program nears universal access. Over time, the gap between revenues and expenses narrows as the pace of slot growth slows. By 20 um, I'm sorry, by FY 2039, we expect projected revenue to catch up. In recent briefings to the board, PFA staff have shared a graph that illustrates how the revenue smoothing fund will work. We'll embed this graph when we publish our TSCC hearing responses so everyone can see it. In early years, when we have a surplus, the revenue smoothing fund balance is growing. As the number of preschool seats grows and gets closer to full universal access, the fund balance starts to decrease. The program switches into deficit and the surplus saved in the first few years will be spent down. Over time, as slot growth slows and the program is well established, revenues and expenses will even out. This means that the program is fully funded and aside from contingency and, reverse, and reserve funds, the fund balance lands at zero. And I should say the revenue smoothing fund balance lands near zero at the end of every year. And I think that was it. I think I understand. Yes. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the picture. I, I do think that, uh, I think that helps too. It's hard for, you know, as we're standing around on the playground talking about uh, the challenges of childcare and all of that, it's hard to see that big fund balance uh, and say, where, where is that? So is that helpful for the long-term planning? Yeah, please. Um, thank you. I do think I understand. And it, it sounds like, and maybe I missed this in the um, ballot materials, but like in some ways this had to be the plan, right? Long. Okay. Um, so then could you talk at all about other things? Like I hear that 
the idea is to allow smaller providers opportunity through kind of delaying the outlay of funds to to ramp up and to be able to field. Um, are, are there other things that the county is doing besides kind of this built-in delay that will help build that deeper um, bench of providers? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, Preschool for All has, um, since its implementation, has started programs such as the Pathways Program, which is really about bringing in providers um, into our system, even if they may not be ready to be preschool for all providers today, it helps um, educate them about what it means to be a preschool for all provider, um, provide some coaching so that they are able to, um, to, to, to start on literally the pathway to becoming a preschool for all provider, making the investments um, that gets them ready. We know we need to grow the number of providers we have. We have to make sure that our existing providers are ready um, to be preschool for all providers. We also are working with um, our colleges and universities in terms of um, funding scholarships and opportunities for people to get their degrees or certificates in early childhood education to help grow the number of people who are, who are focused on preschool for all as a career. I think the fact that we have living wages for our preschool providers and even the classroom assistants is a part of that, drawing people into this field that really shows the value of this work and the importance to um, the role that they have in developing our young our young children. Um, and we also are um, um, setting aside dollars into a facilities fund. So facilities are also like the bricks and mortar where people are, where these children are gonna go, where these classrooms are going to be is a big piece of that. Um, we had some dollars set aside um, Last year, we had um, we got a provider on board, a third party who's helping to um, put those funds into action. So we'll be able to roll over some of those dollars as well as increasing the investment in the facilities fund to make sure that we have um, that as a as a um, tool and as a resource for people who are looking to expand and um, develop new new classroom spaces. Thanks. That's really helpful. Um, the Pathways program, if I remember, I think you did mention that last year. Did it? It has it been running now for a full year? Is that right, or am I? Yeah, it has been running for um, for at least a full year now, and will continue as we're bringing more providers on. And I don't have the exact number, but I do know that some of the providers that were in the Pathways program are now becoming preschool for all providers. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, at, without kind of the specific details, I guess I just wanted you know at the high level if you felt like the first year plus of the Pathways program was giving the um, results that you were hoping for with that. Yeah. We've seen good success Great. with that. Thank you. I have one more follow up. <laughs> uh, I've I've seen the advertisements for slots and open, and I know you have more open seats. Can you talk a little bit about the the challenges of filling the seats and some of the barriers that um, you're coming across to to get kids into those programs? Yeah, you know, we've had, um, I think we've had really good success with getting children into those classrooms. Um, we did exceed the the estimate that we wanted to have for our first year, and I, and I hope that we will be able to do that for this upcoming school year as well. I think um, some of the challenges that we've seen is, is really matching our providers with where 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 families want to go. Um, one of the things, and this is just anecdotal, but we, I know that there was a situation where a family was offered a preschool for all slot and then decided not to take it because they already had a younger child in a different program and that and so you know transportation is a real thing how you you know um i have kids at two different schools right now that's you know it's it's a it's a um, a challenge um so i think that's one of the things we also um know that there are families who for instance might have been part of the head start program and received a slot both for preschool for all and head start and just decided to choose head start because they were familiar with that program so i think as more people become familiar with preschool for all you know th that will be happen less and less I, i'm delighted that you mentioned the uh head start program because this is the focus of my question last year i asked if you force how you foresaw com collaborating with helping and staffing challenges between the new preschool for all program the existing public program and the private market for child care you're all chasing chasing customers you're all chasing staff how's that working yeah, you know, I think that is something that we are being very uh, intentional about, and I know our preschool and early learning division staff um, talk frequently with folks at the state level, for instance, with the programs that are publicly funded at the state, um, working with other providers um, 
and um, and with our um, child care resource and referral teams to talk about just those kinds of issues to to make sure that we're doing that. I think the 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 important thing to remember is when we start this work, and even now we have a child care desert in Multnomah County for infants and toddlers. We it may even be a child care desert for preschool after the pandemic because we have lost twenty percent of our child care providers since then. Um, so I will say that we desperately need additional resources for families with young children. And the the work that we're doing in partnership is really to um, grow the number of providers and teachers and classroom assistants that are able to that are in the field because that is a need that we have. It's a need that we're gonna we're gonna have to um, fill as we move to universal for preschool for all. We are working through both the Pathways program, through um, some of our coaching and the outreach that is happening with folks who are private preschool providers because we want them to be a part of our preschool for all program, right? Um, it is taking the, you know, this is really a system that's taking the burden away from families to privately fund their own tuition for preschool and turning it into a publicly program. And so that's going to that's gonna be a transition of our system, really. It's going to look like... Um, you know, a, a, a really big change for Multnomah County, and that's going to take some time, but it's something that's we're doing thoughtfully and in partnership with with both existing providers and existingly um, existing public funders. All right, we'll move along to another important topic, and we have a series of questions about the houseless, homeless supportive services attending uh, uh, mental health and behavioral pro problems. And before we jump into those questions, I'd like to just take a moment to kind of tee that up. This is my last chance here <laughs> to meet with you. Um, you know, you are here as elected officials. We are appointed commissioners. We're all here to serve the people of Multnomah County and to um, badly borrow from ver a very famous saying, you know, we're here because, not because the problems are easy, but because the problems are hard. And so as citizen representatives, we need to ask you questions that are what we know to be important to the people of Multnomah County right now. And so we ask for your candor in acknowledging, um, you know, the current situation, um, your thoughtfulness about um, ways to overcome the obstacles and your hopes for future solutions. So that's the spirit in which we ask these questions. Start with the supportive housing um, program. I mean, for the last, I don't know, two months, the media has been hitting us from the morning paper to the noon news to the evening news about the difficulties in deploying the resources for the supportive housing uh, uh, dollars that you have. What are the obstacles you're encountering and how are you going to address them? So I will take this question. You know, this is, I came into here saying housing and houselessness is going to be my number one priority. And that has absolutely been the case since I've taken office. I'm committed to setting priorities and focus for the joint office under new leadership, both me as the chair and with Dan Field as the new director of the joint office of homeless services. And I will say, um, I appreciate your comments, Margaret. And I will say that his, um, he came in here into this job, I think with that same kind of mentality of he is here not because um, the problems are are easy, but because they're hard and he is ready for that work. Um, but the work of setting those priorities and the focus is going to include the input of every single person on this board. It includes increasing the urgency and impact of efforts to address the humanitarian crisis on our street, utilizing tools and methods that improve the data on work happening throughout the system, improving the efficacy of our continuum of care, and putting more specific accountability measures in place that ensures money, time, and effort invested in reducing homelessness and increasing housing stability is effective and strategic. We have recently reported that our supportive housing services reflected a significant amount of underspent dollars. And as I said in my letter to the city commission and the county commissioners, 
um, the mayor's office and Metro, um, that this is unacceptable. We're working with the board, of, the county board of commissioners, the mayor's office and Metro to identify short term opportunities to spend supportive housing service measure dollars consistent with program object objectives. And we will convene key joint office contracted service providers in June to help us identify obstacles and impediments to service delivery, address underspending, and outline new accountability measures. Lastly, we're in the process of hiring a consultant with national expertise and system performance to increase best practices and efficiencies in distributing funds and propose process improvements for organizational and structural changes. We have committed funds allocated across fiscal years due to our intergovernmental agreement and medium term housing commitments. These obligations will be reported in our quarter four report with any remaining unspent dollars carrying over into fiscal year 2024. In June, you're going to be convening a group to identify obstacles that I, that's what you said. So in June, we are convening the, the providers, the provider network that is doing the work that are holding contracts with the Joint Office Homeless Services to really dig into some of the, the obstacles that are, I think, um, happening on both sides in terms of um, what is preventing these dollars from flowing out into the community and the work being done as efficiently um, as we all expect it to be. And I, you know, and I think some of those are things on the Joint Office sides, like, for instance, being able to um, pay providers and to get dollars out into the community more efficiently, right? That's one thing that we've we've heard and we're no, no we're going to talk about. It's also talking about the accountability measures and the um and just the expectations that we have from providers in terms of um, using data effectively and, and reporting out on the work that's being done and the outcomes that are being achieved too. So we're going to be having that conversation specifically with providers in June. Separate from that, we are engaging with a um, with a nationally recognized third party that's going to be providing um, um, advice and um, counsel on the the specific systems improvements that need to be made. Both, I think, internally to the joint office structure, but also um, with the with the plan that we have, the strategic plan we have for getting those supportive housing services measure dollars effectively out into the community too. And that announcement will be happening, I will say, in the next few weeks. I, I guess my um, my concern is that uh, these obstacles are not new. And so the question is, what are you expecting to learn in June that you, <laughs> are you expecting some surprises? I mean. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, they aren't new, but. I'm new as chair and Dan Field is new as the director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. And we haven't had that opportunity to convene with the providers to really set those expectations and to and to address the issues in a really intentional um, way. And, and I think that that's really um, important that we have that conversation. And so that because we aren't able to do this work that we need to be doing out in the community without our providers, they are a critical piece of the of the network. And so we want to make sure that um, we have identified what challenges are that we are working, coming up with solutions to address those right in that in that space and in that time, and that we are we have everybody on board board and they see the commitment from, from both my office and me, and um, and the director of the joint office in in having this partnership move forward um, effectively. And I, I guess lastly. Um, we understand that um, Metro has issued a corrective action plan for this. Are these activities that you've described part of that corrective action, or are there are other things that are being required? So we're, uh, you know, we're in constant conversations with Metro. I would say the Joint Office is really having a lot of conversations about Metro. I think the important thing that, that I have um, taken from what they want to see from us. Um, is that they want to know how the dollars are being spent as soon as possible in ways that really get those dollars out into the community. And that's why as we're looking at underspending of supportive housing services measure or unanticipated funds that may be coming from the supportive housing services measure, having the process in place that's really prioritizing ways that we can get our, our dollars out into the community very quickly or um, commitments that we can make with those dollars that really um, provide sustained um, 
housing and um, supportive services for people right over the long term starting today. That is what we're working with Metro on. So they want to um, they want to be more engaged in making sure that the plan for spending the dollars is something that does have impact, you know, um, in some of those and that we are that we are. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for that we are following the the needs um, and the requirements that are in the supportive housing service measure agreement with Metro and some of those include setting up reserves right and having some of those funds so those those are work um, that we're going to be doing and that will be seen in the plan that we have for our Q4 supportive housing services measure dollars as well as some of the underspending for the Q3 and Q2 dollars. Thank you. I want to assure you that we're, we're talking with Metro tomorrow and we will be talking similarly with the city of Portland. Thank you. Um, thanks for your thoughtful response on that, um, Chair Vega Peterson. Um, my follow up, I guess, is a little bit about values and I, I, maybe there's not a lot of meat here, but I think in the past when we've talked, I think to all kind of the major players in the housing um, and homelessness spectrum, there's a real emphasis on uh, the the key metrics being placements, basically. Um, and then in the community and you know in the media, I think that people's the key metric that folks want, I think, is is fewer people, you know, in bad situations, which is not exactly the same as you know placements. And I'm wondering, you know, as you meet with the providers um, in June or as you're kind of setting the the new direction, I'm wondering if you could give us any thoughts on what the kind of key metrics that you're going to be prioritizing are. Yeah, so one of the first things I did in coming to the office was set up a, a data systems task force, and I appreciate Commissioner Myron's um, work on this, the, the piece around better data and making sure that we have um, metrics and we're tracking things that really um, show the work that we're doing and measure the work that we're doing has been an important priority for her and for me for a long time as well as for this whole board. Um, so when we um, when we convened, we really had two parts of that of that work. One was to cut up to come up with 10 key performance indicators that were going to be shared on the newly revised um, website for the joint office that's going to really show the dashboard of how that works doing. And so, you know, placements was a piece of that. It's an important piece, but it's not the end all be all. It's also how many people have actually been um, outreached to and connected with services. How many people have been um, put, you know, found a shelter bed, right? So moving from unsheltered to sheltered homelessness. How many people then, um, if they have been in um, shelter, how long they're staying, you know, because one of the things that's, and I think there is a question, there's a upcoming question about this, but it's really about making sure that people who are staying in shelters, those are, that's an effective use, right? Those beds are using effectively so that we can be moving more people through the system from unsheltered homelessness to sheltered into permanent housing and, and making sure that that system is working effectively is going to be really important. So we need the data to be proving that um, when people are being housed, how like how long are they like a year later are they still housed right we need to make sure that that people have the support that they need and that's where the permanent supportive services that that come along with the measure are going to be so important as well so there's a variety of those i can provide you with the the list of those key performance indicators but that's going to be i think an ongoing conversation to make sure that we're measuring the right things I'll also say there is work happening right now at the county um, between the joint office and our and our it department to create a tool um, that we'll use with our um, with the the data system that we have. So the um, the county recently, just like very recently in the last month, um, got administrative access for our um, data system from the city. So we now have control about over that. And and what that means is that we are going to be looking at adding a component to that that allows outreach workers to actually. Um, add information and data right into that system. Um, and so that's work that's taking place as well. So I think we are like, it's a new day, I think, in terms of data and what we're going to be able to do with it and using that data to really measure through the, the key performance indicators about what's happening. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my question is about a particular aspect of the crisis response, and that is the county shelter system. So would you please discuss the county's plans for its shelter system and including how many shelters or new shelters uh, look to be needed and and what is the county's plan to providing those shelters? Absolutely. So um, 
You know, right now, um, when we look at the, su the supportive housing services measure funds, right, there's a, a 10 year lifeline for the or 10 year um, lifetime for those funds. So we're really looking at um, how we are focused on um, what's happening with um, the emergency response and the, sh the, the shelter response that we have into a longer term stabilization strategy as people need permanent supportive housing services for permanent housing. Um, but as we make this transition, it allows for the joint office to consider long-term planning and alignment with supportive housing service or goals around permanent supportive housing, rather than focusing on primary immediate interventions. So, so right now in these years, I think we are looking at how we can effectively use those dollars to get, um, to get the right kind of um, support systems in place for shelter, as well as I was talking about earlier, more effective um, uses of those shelter beds. So we're planning the following. We're gonna increase the current service level capacity of 2,400 funded shelter beds to 2,580 funded shelter beds, including returning to pre-pandemic capacity levels across uh, joint office funded shelter sites. We are um, investing capital um, in acquisition and development of emergency shelter sites, and we're doing some of that um, in partnership with um, the city as well. Incorporating housing navigation services such as housing access, placement, and retention strategies within our emergency shelter system, and that's the piece about making those beds more effective for folks. And we're implementing geographic and racial equity in the distribution of shelters and housing services throughout the county. This strategy will further propel the housing first approach, whereby the joint office is moving individuals experiencing homelessness into housing as quickly as possible and increasing access to the emergency shelter system by reducing the length of stay and expanding shelter options. So the joint office works to consider the necessary balance between different shelter models, whether it's emergency shelter, motels, or alternative shelters, and the needs of people experiencing homelessness to provide shelter programs that are appropriately situated to the needs of our community. In FY24, the joint office will continue to work with elected leadership, service providers, and community stakeholders to provide a range of shelter options that meet those needs. Additionally, we will use the 2023 point in time um, county and built for zero to identify the appropriate amount of shelter that is needed here in Multnomah County. We will also use the shelter inflow and outflow data to understand the needs for shelter in balance with our permanent supportive housing placements, rapid rehousing placements, and prevention investments. We have two congregate shelters in process, Arbor Lodge and the Willamette Center. They are currently undergoing major renovation projects and they will be reopening in 2024, which is gonna increase the actual capacity. Arbor Lodge will be a joint congregate and alternative shelter, while Willamette is a congregate site. There are three properties, Cook Plaza, Montevilla, and Harrison, that have been purchased and are going through the county process to determine construction plans and usage. And, um, and so those are the things that we have on par to open up as we're, and as I said before, we're also um, looking at the city and some of the investments they're making in terms of expanding shelter capacity as well. Thank you. Um, just a follow up about alternative shelters in East Portland that the county plans to open. Could you ex explain what an al what makes a shelter an alternative shelter, and what kind of lessons you may have learned from the success or challenges of those shelters that exist already? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and um, I think it's a good opportunity to explain to the public a little bit as we use some of this jargon. So when we talk about um, shelters, right, there's different, there's a whole umbrella of things. Um, some of those, and I think what most people traditionally think of are congregate shelters, where there is usually one open space or maybe a, an open space with, with some um, partitions um, where people are sleeping in a congregate setting where there's either single beds or bunk beds. Um, we have several of those, and those were, I think, the primary way that um, shelters were um, being established as, as I was coming onto the commission, for instance. Um, we have in recent years looked at different options, especially because of COVID. Um, there was a lot more investment in motel shelters because uh, those were really good for isolating people who were either um, at risk or more medically vulnerable, um, you know, during the, the during the pandemic or needed a place to isolate if they were um, sick. And um, and so that has been um, something that we've used. It's also been used, I think, traditionally for families with vouchers to motel systems as kind of an emergency basis. And then we have alternative shelters. And these are um, really, there's a, a wide variety of um, options for um, alternative shelters. 
they a lot of these are we we think of as the villages that we've seen where there have been um, small mini houses or mini communities where people are actually um, able to um, be in a community have a community established and um, often those are on um, land that is um, either you know publicly owned or a lot of time there are um, churches or other institutions that want to donate land for these things we even have private landowners who are who are using land for these kind of mini um, alternative shelter sites and so that's a model so you can think of the uh, safe rest villages that the city has as, as a as a type of alternative shelter site i have one more follow-up sure uh so we've talked a I'm getting a good picture, I think, finally, about how the data is being used and all the different mechanisms. I think you are all in a, a difficult position, right? You are trying to serve a population um, while also trying to engage with uh, the the rest of the public about what they see, right? That that perception of homelessness and houselessness and uh, people, uh, the the experience of people on the streets. And I, I think I just want to give you an opportunity to, to, to kind of cross that boundary, right? That how do we bridge uh, for people listening and certainly for us at the table as representatives, but how do you bridge kind of that gap between the services you're providing and the ramp up of those services and what people's perception is and the pace at which you know those don't necessarily match but the work that you're doing is also not not enough right that 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 challenge uh that we are all facing and we're seeing in the news and then um kind of regularly out there yeah you know i think it's um so I appreciate that question and I and I appreciate the reality of what we're all dealing with, right? And it and it feels like we don't have a way to help people individually. Like I met a woman who was literally walking down my block and I had a conversation with her and she was a former nurse who had um, had a substance use disorder and was found herself living on the street. And I was like, oh, well, you can go here for help or you can call this. And she doesn't have a cell phone and everything. And it, I ended up writing on a piece of paper and handing it to her, but I felt like that's all I can do. I'm the chair of Multnomah County and this is all I can do, right? Um, so so I understand the both the frustration about what people are seeing outside and the desire to help and change what we're seeing. And that is that is the work that I am focused on. And I know this board and the joint office is focused on the entire county, honestly, with, with urgency and with passion. Um, we are doing a lot of work right now to make sure at the systems level, at the county level that we are working in partnership, that we are working effectively, and we are taking a, a hard look and, and pushing for changes where they need to happen so we have better performance in our system, especially those parts of the system that the county is responsible for. Um, and at the same time, we are leading with our values in terms of making sure that we are treating people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness um, with, with compassion and with acknowledging um, their own you know, um, autonomy and individual um, needs as we are creating that system that um, that provides for them, right? And so we want to have different options for people. We want to have pathways that respect where people are coming from too. It is it is a, a lot of work. It is a big work, but um, I think one of the things that has been really meaningful and and um, important is that the partnership that we have now between the city and the county, between uh, the county and Metro is stronger than it's been in a very long time. And I think that's something that people can take heart in is that there is a, a concerted effort and a, a, and a um, unified desire to really address this issue together. Margo. Could you talk a little more for us and for the public about where emergency shelter services or alternative <laughs> shelter services meet with supportive housing services. I mean, people think emergency services, people are getting a motel voucher for a day or two days or five days, or how long is an emergency? And how do you get from emergency to, to, to forward progress? <laughs> So, um, so when you can think of um, the shelter, the, our shelter continuum, like our continuous shelter care, as both um, 
like some emergency, right? Maybe it's just a day or two for if somebody's leaving, for instance, like a domestic violence situation and they need a place to go temporarily. Like there is that kind of emergency um, shelter. There's also the emergency shelter that we establish in severe weather conditions, right? Those are also considered types of emergency shelter. But the shelter, um, um, that the shelters that we are investing in over a longer term are really for permanent types of shelter, um, sh you know, sites where people are able to stay, and the length of time for that stay is might be thirty days, sixty days, ninety days, maybe sometimes longer. But really, we're working to we we need to work to make sure that the that it is as short as possible for people as they move into permanent housing. And so when people are moved into permanent housing, that's when you start thinking about the support, the permanent supportive housing services and um, assistance that they may need to be able to be successful in staying housed in that permanent housing. The, the connections to those kinds of services and, and absolutely the connections to starting on that pathway to housing have to happen for people who are, who are in those shelters, um, but that, Permanent supportive housing may be um, access to treatment, access to um, medical care, access to long-term rental assistance so that they can stay housed and have the support that they can afford to be housed, all of those things. So there's a, a wide variety of what that supportive services could look like as somebody is, is being moved into housing. We're working with a lot of our community-based organizations, with our healthcare partners, and in, in terms of exactly what those are, um, can be, you know, there's, so it's not just the county that is doing that. Um, by any means, um, but that is a little bit of the difference when we talk about shelter and getting people safely off the street from unsheltered homelessness into sheltered, and then and then move, making that transition and pathway into permanent housing. Add something, Chair. Thank you. Oh yes, and Commissioner Dow, Paul. I add mm -hmm. something. I really appreciate this conversation, and I appreciate the sort of tee up of it to say, you know, can we be candid? Can we help the public understand what they're seeing? And your question about how do we. I think a lot of the questions around shelter come from this place of how do we address street homelessness? Because it isn't it isn't it isn't what we want to see people experiencing. Um, just a couple of things. One is that different kinds of shelter work for different kinds of people, right? So in terms of thinking about what it is that we need, and when I say work, I think we all want to make sure that shelter isn't a permanent condition, that shelter is on the path to housing. And so there are different some folks. For some folks, congregate shelter can work. For others, it really has to be alternative shelter because they need the space and because congregate shelter is not a place where they can um, kind of gather themselves and move on to the next step. So that's that's one issue I think that we're constantly balancing. Um, I think the other piece is shelter seems like the option for how we address street homelessness. And we all believe in both and, right? And we are funding both and. We're funding shelter and we're funding rent assistance and we're funding supportive housing services. We are funding all and. However, when I hear the both and conversation, I sometimes want to inject a dose of reality and say there isn't unlimited both and. We have a lot of resources, but we don't have enough for an unlimited both and. We don't have enough for everybody to be sheltered as the strategy. And just as an example, and someone's in the joint office is watching me and saying, oh my God, she's gonna put out the wrong numbers. But as an example, <laughs> as an example, if, if we think of shelter as costing somewhere between $20,000 to $30,000 a year, you know, I think I'm in the ballpark. Um, as another, for example, the, the sort of mass camps that we're discussing with the city appear to be projected at about $60,000 per year. And if we think we have about 3,000 people living unsheltered currently, if you do the math, that is somewhere between $90 million a year and $180 million a year to provide shelter, right? That substantially limits what we can do in the other parts of the both and. So I think that's really the answer to your question about shelter. How do you plan for shelter? We need a variety of options. We need to you know, there, there's not a precise way to determine how much of each kind of shelter, how much shelter versus rent assistance versus supportive housing services. I think everybody, every jurisdiction, everybody in the joint office, every provider is trying to figure out what the answer to that is, and there isn't a magic answer. So I hope that's helpful. Could I add something to that? If, since we're adding. Um, just that relates to that question and um, injecting the, I, I think there is, 
we all on the board absolutely agree we need an array of options to meet a variety of needs and um the the dose of reality that is also important to consider is you know as we go up from 2400 to 2580 shelter beds that's 150 added ish plus and we have a 3000 people living outside the question is what is happening to those individuals and the reality of the injury, harm, and death that is occurring in increasing numbers on the streets. And so that's a part of it as well. So within our limited resources, we need to be looking at both, not just this amount of money has to go to shelter and this amount of money has to go to housing, rent assistance, and all of those things, but are we using within the realm of shelter are we using those funds as wisely as possible and understanding those needs even within what we're doing so there's a range motels super expensive congregate shelter less expensive you know dignity village really really cheap and effective so you know in in many ways so what are we doing to save lives thinking of it as a public health uh, and safety concern as well sorry that's no. I mean, you're dying. I can't. I can't. I think it's a good transition to our next. Yeah, a wonderful topic. conversation. Um, and uh, my question has to do with part of what we've been talking about, which is this issue of substance abuse in my neighborhood. Um, the folks that don't seem to be going into any of these housing programs um, seem to me, I'm not an expert, but they seem to be struggling with substance abuse. And the county is uniquely positioned because substance abuse is, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a it's a health issue, it's a prosecution issue, uh, it's a law enforcement issue, and these are all areas of expertise that the uh, county is involved with. And so the question has to do with coordination of efforts. So you're doing all of these different things. And so the question is, how are you coordinating these efforts for maximum impact? And, you know, you know, when will we see even more progress? Thank you for that. Very difficult. It, it, <laughs> and I'll take or uh, I'll take that question. And, yeah, I, you know, I think we all realize we're seeing overlapping crises: um, houselessness, substance use, and mental health. Um, absolutely. And we're not unlike other jurisdictions across the country. We're not we're not exceptional in, in that sense. Um, so we have faced a rapid increase in substance use and overdose that corresponds to myriad factors, including isolation from services and support during the COVID-19 pandemic, changing substance use behaviors, and decades of chronic underfunding of public health, particularly to address the social determinants of health. The health department takes an integrated and comprehensive public health approach to addressing and solving our community substance use crisis. This work is divided across the four core areas, prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support. The work is conducted across all of the clinical divisions of the health department, behavioral health, corrections health, public health, and integrated clinical services. There are 17 different teams and or programs that integrate substance use prevention or services as a primary element of their mission and activities. The county is a leader in delivery of harm reduction and clinical treatment services for substance use. The health department operates multiple harm reduction sites where people who use drugs and their drug using networks can receive syringes and safe smoking supplies, drug test strips, naloxone, overdose prevention education, HIV, STI testing and treatment, wound care, and connection with treatment, as ready. In this fiscal year, from July 2022 to April 2023, the Harm Reduction Clinic has served more than 4,000 unique clients. Within the Behavioral Health Division, the Addictions and Prevention Unit has more than 100 contracts with partners across the community to provide residential treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, recovery mentoring, and support. Clinical Services for Youth incorporates drug and alcohol assessment during the mental health assessment and connects youth with harm reduction supports and referrals for substance use disorder services as needed. Every person brought into custody in a correctional facility is screened for current or a history of substance use. 
Individuals who indicate current substance use immediately receive medication supported recovery, MSR. To ensure continuity of care and support prior to release, Corrections Health works with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and community partners to connect clients with the MSR services in the community and other recovery and supportive services. And of course, this work isn't limited to the health department. Addressing and preventing substance use requires an interdisciplinary approach that reflects both individual and systemic circumstances. And the health department works closely with many other departments and jurisdictions to identify, implement, and sustain cross-departmental cross services and programs. All of our programming and services prioritize using trauma-informed and culturally specific approaches, including building teams with culturally specific staff, developing peer-led models, offering services in a wide range of languages, providing programming and services at easily accessible sites, and contracting with community-based organizations. Many of the immediate limitations to the county's response to the substance use crisis pertain to infrastructure, policy, and funding that are outside the county's jurisdiction. While we seek to work collaboratively with the other jurisdictions involved, this limits our ability to prevent and reduce substance use and overdose. Similarly, state policy and funding have a significant impact on behavioral health trends and outcomes, including Measure 110 and the Mossman Order, which have changed how individuals access services and the institution tasked to provide services. Healthcare workforce shortages have also profoundly impacted delivery. At present, all teams report significant and disruptive workforce shortages, shortage issues as barriers, which exacerbates challenges to entering and navigating substance use programming and services. So, um, in the media, um, perhaps I'm seeing it on the streets because I'm seeing an awful lot of folks in my neighborhood anyway, who seem to be struggling. Um, I'm wondering if some of these uh, substances are um, so powerful. So for example, we all been hearing about fentanyl, um, that there are, are they beyond our capacity to once somebody gets into that, uh, to help them? What is, what is your feeling about that? Is there something that some coordinated effort that's being made to address the power of some of these substances? I think you're going well beyond my expertise at this point and thinking about the science and the research on that. And I, my, my, I think the answer is that we don't know yet. Okay. Right. Uh, but I also think that, and I don't know if we've got behavioral health folks here, that, that there are approaches that we can take with the right systems and the funding. Um, but I'm going to stop there before I get into trouble and wait for a behavioral health specialist. Yeah, I am. I'm happy to to um, respond to that. And then if someone's here from behavioral health, we can um, have them come up. Um, but I will say, so we are um, really looking at, and, and you're absolutely right, Mark. There is um, what we're seeing in terms of the drugs and the and the impacts of the drugs on on human on the human body and the human psyche is is different than what we've seen before. Whether it's the fentanyl, P2P, Trank, even that's uh, that is um, starting to to um, show up here. It's it's different. It has different impacts, right? On um, on people. It looks very different um, than what we saw, like in decades past, where, where we're talking about opioids or heroin or or whatnot. Um, so our we're really taking a a one county approach to this. So we have our teams across the county who are convening and making sure that they're coordinating the work and the response to this. Whether we're, we're looking at it from um, our our harm reduction, our prevention, our um, the way that we are um, providing services, you know, directly for for folks and connecting them. Um, there also will be a convening that we'll have with um, some of our external partners as well, because we know some of these are beyond just kind of the immediate um, fact of people um, uh, using drugs. Um, it also has to do with how those drugs are coming into our community and what the response looks like for that. It looks like how um, how people are. Um, you know, who are using or are being engaged with, right? And so for the first time, I will say, and you may have, have heard this for the first time, just um, uh, several weeks ago, the um, Portland Police Bureau started using the Measure 110 citations where they're actually um, giving people citations if they if they find them using and um, and the offering them the chance to use the phone number and do that. I think there had been 40 
of those given out like in the prior since measure 110's implementation and then in one day they had like they they went over that number in just one day. So that that's something new that hadn't been happening before. I don't know what impact, if any, that will have. Um, but we have to have conversations holistically about um, for all the different roles and all the jurisdictions that are that are um, um, engaged in this. And, and this is something that is different than what we've seen before. It looks different in terms of how it's affecting people, um, the ability for people to to detox, right? Just to, to stabilize, to sober, to stabilize and to detox looks different than it than it has before. And so those are, these are new things. And so we're having new conversations and looking at um, different kinds of investments that we need in our community to be able to address this. Thank you. Um, thank you both. I'm not sure, and Commissioner Jayapal, I, I think you and I come from a similar background and feeling like the real way to address, um, you know, our community substance abuse issues is kind of the, um, you know, demand side and trying to reduce the, um, folks who fall into those patterns and give them, you know, support that they need um, and reduce harm. Um, and Chair Becky Peterson did kind of glancingly talk about the, the supply side, but I wondered if there was anything else that folks should know kind of about the county's response to, you know, dealers or other, you know, like people who are individuals or systems or groups that are kind of bringing, um, illicit substances to the community and what our response on that side is. You know, I think the county's role there obviously is on the law enforcement side and with the with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office. And uh, they are working very closely with all of the other law enforcement jurisdictional partners, Brown Police Bureau, um, the FBI, to do interdiction of supply. Um, they are focusing and have for some time focusing on, obviously on large suppliers rather than on small suppliers. I think that's primarily where our intersection with the supply piece is. Um, to build a little bit on what Chair Vega Peterson said about Measure 110 and that system, um, something else that we've been working on, that I've been working on, is developing that system to be more robust. And so where Measure 110 now provides a citation with a phone number for someone to get services, whether user or dealer, and I think we have to remember that those populations overlap, right? They're not. They're not distinct in the way that we sometimes talk about them. Um, so rather than the citation process, to have something that's a lot more robust. And when an officer, for example, is at the point of arrest, whether of a dealer and, and, or a citation for, a, for a, someone who's buying, that you have a really warm handoff to services, that is not just a phone number that's given to somebody, but rather that it is um, a social service provider that comes on site and then case management that tracks that person. That's not going to address everybody, and I think one of the things that we all know is that there's no one solution for every piece of the problem that we're trying to address. But I think that's something that we're working on that would provide us another pathway for a subset of the population that's either dealing or using because of unmet needs of some other kind. So um, just a little bit additional of that. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I have the next question, which I'm very happy about. Uh, as a longtime democracy nerd, I'm very excited to get to uh, ask the uh, county about uh, upcoming elections changes. And I do see that we have the one and only uh, Tim Scott, uh, county elections director in, in the back. And I can't think of somebody uh, better positioned to be implementing new changes. We're so lucky to have um, Director Scott with the county. Um, I was hoping that you could talk uh, about the county's capacity to manage the changing um, election systems, both with City of Portland moving to ranked choice vote while well, single transferable vote um, style of ranked choice voting um, in 2024 and the changes. Uh, I think the county's changes to ranked choice voting is 26. Is that right? Or is it also 24? OK, so anyway, those kind of overlapping changes and how the county is both going to handle the back end kind of administrative changes, but then also whatever help we're doing to make sure the community understands the changes in their ballot and the changes that they'll see with the election process. Thank you. I will uh, take that question again, Commissioner Sharon Myron, District 1. Um, I also uh, would be happy to talk after this event about things related to addiction and behavioral health as those I am an ER doctor. I do Portland street medicine. I see the impact on the streets and on people 
and there's a lot more to that story. So I would love to have conversations if you're interested. Um, for elections, the elections division is intently focused on successful implementation of ranked choice voting beginning in the 2024 general election. This work is well underway and includes reviewing and updating policies, procedures, and technology, as well as educating voters. The Elections Division and City of Portland staff collaborated to inform City Elections Code Amendments for Ranked Choice Voting that City Council adopted in April. County and City staff are also collaborating in development of voter education and outreach plans for Ranked Choice Voting. In parallel with the development of amendments to the City's Election Code, County Elections staff began cons consultative discussions with its IT vendor as they work to add ranked choice voting capabilities to the county voting's county county voting's county's voting system software this software update will go into federal certification testing between July and September of this year so it will be ready for state and local certification and testing in time for the November 2024 election county election staff are also consulting with colleagues from Clackamas County Washington County and the Secretary of State's office to ensure coordinated, timely, transparent, accessible, and accurate administration of the, of the election for ranked choice voting contests. The Elections Division initiated its work in fiscal year 2023 to implement ranked choice voting with existing and temporary staff. Our fiscal year 2024 budget include strategic investments to ensure the elections division can continue to deliver on this work and its other functions heading into the, pre the presidential election year. The budget includes a bilingual voter education and outreach staff person, a supervisor for the team who's the first point of contact for voters that need help, and a limited duration project manager for ranked choice voting. The budget also includes funding for upgrading the county's ballot design and vote tally system software, for a consultant to help plan a ranked choice voting voter education media campaign, and for development of education and outreach media and materials. We see synergies between the implementation of ranked choice voting and ongoing work to provide reliable and trusted information to voters to promote and support voting and to administer a secure and accurate election. And I, I particularly appreciate your dedication, uh, Commissioner Offsink, to this, this special work. Thank you. Um, especially with all of the things changing in 24 and then 26, and it seems like there's been a big shift nationally to kind of throw mud on elections and election results, particularly if folks don't like the outcome of it. I'm wondering if the county has given, I, I heard um, in the budget and we saw in the budget that there's a position to do kind of proactive um, communication, which I think is great and is you know the most important thing to make sure folks understand how their ballot is gonna work and how the results will work. I wonder if the county is also thinking about the kind of you know reactive mes messaging should there be folks who see it you know politically advantageous afterwards to say oh it didn't you know it didn't work look here's this nitpicky thing with the new system um and so whatever we should rehold the election or these results are invalid um and i wonder you know i mean i don't, I don't think it's new um i think we've seen over the last whatever especially for six years um, that those allegations have grown. Um, but especially given this big kind of change, it seems ripe that folks might be, um, you know, throwing that kind of uh, criticism at the county. And I wonder just if there's been special consideration or thought given to how the county's gonna respond. That is such a great question. And I will uh, turn it over. <laughs> I, I appreciate that question. I think you're you're right. I think that people will be watching to see how this implementation implementation goes both in 2024 and 2026 um, for these elections. I will say, you know, we you are absolutely right. Tim Scott and our elections division team are incredible um, public servants who are committed to upholding the um, the the 
sanctity of our elections process. And, and that isn't going to, I mean, that has always been the case and that will continue to be the case. So I think the, um, the work that they do in, in getting ready for this, that the quality and the excellence in the work and getting ready to make this change and to implement this change, um, is, is something that we can be assured of. And, and also, you know, really doing that um, work around educating people as much as possible. I think we do need to be working closely with our with our partners at at the, the city and at the Secretary of State's office in terms of um, having that coordinated response to these allegations of elections fraud or you know errors or whatever whatever the they're they're throwing at it. We've seen that across the country. I think we've seen a little bit of that here in Oregon. But the other thing that we know is that. Um, people in Oregon trust our election system. We've had vote by mail for decades now, and people are proud of it. People, um, we have really great voting turnout in the state. And so I think we have like a history and, um, and a legacy of, of people really believing in our process. But I do think that, um, we always have to be aware of and ready for, you know, potential, um, folks who might be, as you said, throwing mud at, at what's happening here. So I think we just need to um, make sure that we have done everything possible to to ensure that the changeover works well and also be ready to to kind of um, respond if necessary. Our last two questions are going to shift gears a little bit to talk about the federal uh, one-time dollars or few-year dollars from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, we know the county has started a number of new programs over the last few years. And last year, you spoke to us about the thoughtful approach the county took uh, to add those federal dollars where they were most needed. Can you give us an example of a program where you measured the impact of those dollars and what the results were? Just as we start to wind down those federal dollars, um, how did it go? I'll take that question again, Diane Rosenbaum from uh, District 3 on the commission. When the pandemic first began, the community need was immense. The federal government acted quickly to prevent a long, severe recession with direct assistance to businesses and households. But the initial pandemic impacts hit our most vulnerable communities the hardest, and the recovery has been uneven and inequitable. The county chose to allocate ARP funds by fulfilling a role as the local public health authority while applying an equity lens and county values to the decision making process. The county allocated ARP resources to five priority areas public health emergency response, core services supporting people in our care, restore services impacted by budget reductions, crisis response, and community recovery and finally, critical county infrastructure. The county's ARP funding went to a wide variety of programs within these priority areas, but we'll highlight a couple of notable programs and their impact. First, rent assistance. The county has dedicated a significant amount of ARP resources to rent assistance during the pandemic in response to the economic upheaval. In fiscal year 2023, 69.2 million was allocated to rent assistance and program administration from a variety of state and federal sources, with 25.5 million coming from the county's direct ARP allocation. Funding is distributed through a network of nonprofit organizations. As of April, 7,751 households had received emergency rent assistance in fiscal year 2023. And since the beginning of fiscal year 2022, 5,354 households have received rent assistance to prevent imminent eviction through the Bienestar Rapid Response Eviction Prevention Program. Then vaccinations. As the local public health authority, the county led the local COVID-19 response. An equity lens was applied to all ARP funding decisions, and the county was able to leverage its relationships with local, culturally specific organizations to deliver vaccines to our marginalized communities. Through public health, corrections health, and the community health center, the county provided over 5,100 vaccinations to almost 4,000 individuals and hosted over 150 vaccine events with our partners. Then Multnomah Mothers Trust. 
Multnomah Mothers Trust provides an unconditional basic income to 100 black female headed households with children who have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. Participants receive an unconditional basic income of $500 per month. Program participants also participate in research and program development by either inputting information about their economic and social condition into an existing database or by participating in a design process for programs intended to build assets over time or to decrease debt. For this, they receive a $500 technology grant, $50 a month for the data entry, and $150 per design session. By June of 2022, the program participants were reporting lower levels of debt and an increase in assets. 80% of participants have reported a positive increase in quality of life, economic stability, and or child educational success. So those are a few examples. Thank you. It's time to talk about the free lunch money here. L last year, we asked the county, as we asked all of our districts using uh, federal money, what's your plan for when these dollars conclude and this year we're asking similar questions um we know that you're using the last of your federal dollars in this budget and also some one-time county funds to continue some selective programs certainly not all the programs that began with the federal money but some selective programs um are these one-time programs destined <laughs> to become a permanent ongoing expense. What's the future look like for the demand that's been created by these programs? Thank you, Margo. Lori Stegman, uh, Multnomah County Commissioner for District 4. So I'll take that. And that is a very valid question. So when the county began making decisions about allocating ARP resources, we were really careful to stress to both our internal and external audiences that this funding was temporary and it needed to be allocated to address pandemic impacts. By applying a disciplined approach, we avoided funding normal county programs and functions with these temporary resources. Starting in the fiscal year 2023 budget development process, we tried to be discerning about which programs originally funded with ARP would serve an ongoing purpose. This was based on the success of the program as well as an evolving understanding of what the post pandemic world would look like. We have converted $29.8 million of ARP funded programs to general fund funding. A table in the budget director's message in our budget breaks out all of this. In fiscal year 2023, we converted several programs to ongoing, to ongoing general fund funding, like eviction prevention support and community violence intervention programs while we have the capacity. In fiscal year 2024, we were able to convert some gun violence case management in the DA's office and funding for a jail dorm to ongoing general fund funding. The majority of the county's direct ARP allocation remaining for fiscal year 2024 is dedicated to rent assistance. The other programs funded by ARP and the programs moved from ARP to the general fund as one time only are planned to ramp down in fiscal year 2024. Based on program experience, it is possible that the county would continue funding for a limited number of these programs in fiscal year 2025, but they would go through the same decision-making process as the rest of our general funds, uh, general fund programs and requests. Our current forecast does not anticipate significant room to add ongoing programs to the general fund. Sorry, uh, just to make sure I understood that. So rent assistance um, and the one-time dollars that were allocated to that, that's gonna be part of the kind of continuing programs that the, or that the county will kind of offset that loss in one-time funding through general fund, or that was in the um, category of stuff that will be ramped down? 
Uh, you know, go ahead, Chair. I'll let you take that. Okay. Question. So, so um, in the proposed budget, the majority of the ARP dollars that we have available this year have gone to rental assistance. We do not, at this point, have capacity in our um, forecasted ongoing general funds to absorb all of those rental assistance dollars. So, we are continuing to have conversations with the state. We are continuing to have conversations about how do we. How do we address the ongoing need for rental assistance dollars, especially as rental prices, housing prices continue to go up in um, in Multnomah County and the Portland metro area? So that that is not something that we've you know that we are going to be able to cover. Um, but it, we know that the ongoing need for rental assistance is very real in our community. Um, and so if you look at you know the one time only um, dollars, especially those that were moved from ARPA to one time only, it really was um, with the um, with the intention of of um, funding um, things that we know had a higher impact during COVID that we saw during the pandemic and and really using this year to see how are those things, changing over the course of this year, whether we're talking about gun violence, whether we're talking about the continued need for rental assistance, um, whether we're talking about, um, you know, some of the supports around, um, you know, domestic violence and, and things, mental health services, those kinds of things. And, and I will say, this is one of those where, you know, you asked the challenges and I talked about coming in midstream for the budget. This was one of those areas where having that uh, consistency from the departments in terms of um, you know, a new chair coming in to really be able to examine and have those ongoing conversations about what those investments are look like, which ones are are really being impactful that we may want to consider using precious ongoing general fund dollars for. Um, so that is that will be meticulous work over the next year for for me and my team and for the departments at the county. Thank you. Um, I had a follow up from many questions ago that I think this kind of re segues into and I really appreciated um, Commissioner Jayapal you're kind of reminding folks with respect to you know housing that the pie is only so big and so we can cut it up you know in a number of different ways but we can't just print more money um, and so and and this answer with respect to kind of the you know, we had a large influx of rental assistance money and used that strategically um, to address acute needs during the pandemic, but it's still an ongoing need. Um, and so I think we've asked kind of a lot about public, you know, perception. And I'm just wondering kind of in in closing um, with the issue of, you know, housing and uh, housing affordability, homelessness, and the part kind of in the middle of people who, who are housing, but kind of housed, but housing insecure. And, you know, that rental assistance was like one strategy to keep people in, in homes. Um, these are hard decisions, and I'm wondering how the county kind of uh, communicates why we've split the pie the way that we have, right? I think that the the community sees, you know, people living outside and, you know, people in bad, you know, situations is kind of the most visible. But, I, you know, in many ways, it seems like that's also kind of the most expensive and least effective place to address, you know, the, the problem. And so how how are you kind of balancing and how are you communicating that balance of, you know, from the fixed pie, you know, things might be best spent in a way that's less visible um, for folks. Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful question. And um, and we talked earlier, a lot of the questions were really about the shelter versus permanent housing, but we didn't talk about that prevention piece very much at all. And that is a really critical, most cost-effective way, honestly, to reduce um, the chance of people becoming homelessness, the numbers of, of people experiencing homelessness in our community. So that is a, a key piece of the strategy and a really important one. Um, and to your question about how do we communicate it, that is a really good point. And I honestly feel like we haven't at the county done a good enough job of talking about those kinds of investments and the impact of those investments, being able to tell those stories, being really clear about that. Um, and you almost have to be more sophisticated in how you tell those stories because the, it isn't the visible piece. It isn't what people are seeing every day. And so really um, making that connection and making people understand that, that is a challenge. And so I think that, you know, for me, being, you know, making myself available to talk about those things, I'm really highlighting the, the work that's happening um, so that it's not just like, this many people, you know, received um, rental assistance, you know, over the past year, it's not just numbers, but it's really the scope of the work is very important. Um, and then the other piece when you talked about just the reality of like, you know, the need for um, 
for housing assistance and all that is still here. You know, we had our um, general fund forecast yesterday, and one of the the things that was brought out was just how big the income inequality actually is in Multnomah County and the sheer number of people who are are living um, at or below the poverty line or definitely below, you know, the the kind of um, um, the the livability, right? You know, living wage and a living salary. That is that is a very real thing in Multnomah County. I think we need to be moving that forward too, so people can really have an understanding of just how many people are in need, are at risk of um, housing insecurity here in Multnomah County. Thank you. Right. Uh, that wraps up our questions. I I want to thank the commission, the chair, and commissioners so much for your candor and your thoughtfulness. You are dealing with the most complicated issues in our county and facing uh, people in Multnomah County, and we were just appreciative of the conversation and the dialogue um, and the opportunity to hear kind of these details that don't eke out into the newspaper um, or maybe aren't as visible. Um, and we look forward to following up even more on all the data that you're collecting and this new work next year. Um, so with that, I will now close the hearing and open a regular business meeting of the TSCC. Commissioners, do you have any additional comments on the budget? No. Okay. Uh, Allegra, can you please share the staff recommendation for the certification letter? Uh, yes, I would be happy to. I would like to start by commending staff uh, on a very thorough and informative budget document. There's so much detail in the materials that you produce, and it is so helpful for digging through and understanding and answering questions. Uh, as mentioned in the chair's comments at the beginning, TSCC staff and Multnomah County staff have the opportunity to collaborate and discuss budget issues throughout the year, and we so appreciate that partnership. Uh, not only do we brainstorm tricky budget situations and how to address them, them, but Multnomah County staff also participated in a focus group that we did with TSCC to improve our annual report and the communication that we do with the public. So we, we really treasure that partnership. For the fiscal year 23-24 approved budget, TSCC staff have found budget estimates to be reasonable for the purposes stated and the budget to be in substantial compliance with budget law. TSCC staff have no recommendations or objections to the budget. Thank you, Allegra. May I have a motion authorizing the commission to sign the certification letter as recommended? I will move. I'll second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, the mo aye. I should vote too. <laughs> uh, so certified. Uh, Allegra will have your certification letter. Thank you so much again, everyone. We have um, a few minutes before the library for us to get up, stretch, water, whatever everyone needs to do, and we'll reconvene in a few minutes for the library hearing. Thank you. Yeah.
We'll officially call to order the Multnomah County Library Budget Hearing. I have the right script this time. Uh, my name is Harmony Quiteros. I'm the chair of the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. Welcome. Uh, we'll just we'll just repeat everything. Uh, the TSCC is a community oversight commission established by the Oregon Legislature over a hundred years ago. The commission oversees the budgets of all TSCC member taxing districts and annually conducts a thorough budget review and certification process. Additionally, the TSCC holds public budget hearings like this one to engage with district leadership and provide additional opportunity for public comment before budget adoption. I'll now ask my fellow commissioners and the staff to introduce themselves and state if they have any business relationships with the district that could be perceived as a conflict of interest. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Wobold, and this is my sixth year with the TSCC. It's nice. I always love talking to the library. My library is Hollywood. And um, my day job, before I retired in June, last June, uh, I was a senior policy analyst in the President's Office of Portland State. And I have no perceived or no no uh, issues with this district. Good morning. My name is Margot Norton. This is my eighth and final year on the TSCC. Uh, I live close to Mark, so Hollywood number one. Haven't quite had a chance to experience the moved. Um, I used to also use the fifteenth um, uh, and Fremont uh, Albino Library as my backup. So my Backup has been Belmont recently. Um, in my future or in my past life, I was a government finance officer, um, and I also have a deep love for the library, but no conflict of interest. <laughs> Morning, everyone. I'm James Lofsen Kehim. I'm vice chair of the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission, and like Margot, this is my eighth and final year, um, so at least eighth time talking to the uh, library. Um, and my normal uh, branch is the Belmont Library, but have also been a frequent user of Central. Oh, and I don't have any real or perceived conflicts of interest with district. I'm Matt Donahue, second year on TSCC. Um, I am a public finance banker and uh, financial advisor for DA Davidson. My uh, library is Hollywood as well. Um, and uh, I don't believe I have any overdue fines outstanding, <laughs> and I don't have any uh, conflicts uh, with the library. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Allegra Wilhite, Executive Director with TSCC. Tuni Bechart, Budget Analyst with TSCC. Uh, and like I said, my name is Harmony Kiras. This is my fourth year with TSCC. My second is chair. Uh, mine is the was will be again the Holgate Library um, in under construction uh, in my house. Uh, we are gearing up for the summer reading program as we speak. Uh, I have a kindergartner and a third, oh, I guess almost first grader and almost fourth grader. It's hard for me. Okay. Uh, would uh, the district representatives please introduce yourselves? Yeah. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Annie Lewis. I use she and her pronouns, and I am the deputy director of the Oloma County Library System. Uh, good morning. My name is Katie Shifley. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm the director of finance and facilities for the library. Welcome. Uh, we'll start with some introductory remarks, if you have any, um, after which we'll give an opportunity for public comment, and then we'll ask our questions and discuss the budget with you. Um, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Just want to say that we're really happy to be here today, and we really value the partnership that we have with TACC, and we're excited to, to have the conversation today. Great, thank you. Um, I'll now call on any members of the public who'd like to speak. Each person is limited to three minutes and we'll let you know when you're nearing the end of your time. Allegra, do we have anybody signed up for public comment? No, we have no one signed up. Bummer. Okay, uh, then we will uh, dive into our uh, questions. And I think James, you have the first one. 
do. So the county levies for li or for library bonds that fund capital projects. Uh, these projects will result in significant changes to the library's current built infrastructure from uh, new buildings to refreshing existing ones. We understand that nearly all aspects of the library's physical spaces will be evolving. And I think you heard there's uh, even from this small sample, definitely an effect uh, that's being noticed in the community. Um, how will library programming change as a result of the new spaces and what staff impacts do you expect to see? I'm excited to answer this question. It's really exciting, um, the changes that the, the library capital bond project will bring. Um, the, this bond project will really reinvent how our community can use library spaces. Uh, libraries still have the collections and resources that people love and know, but the true experience of being in a library will really be centered around people. Um, our, this thoughtful expansion of spaces will introduce new, more flexible spaces for programming and services that are responsive to community needs. For decades, the constraints of our physical footprint have impacted where we could offer library programming and services. We now have an opportunity to recenter the library as the place for library services. In addition to supporting popular library programs, we will now be able to offer expanded creative opportunities through the major investment in technology being made in these buildings. Um, these include audio studios for music and podcasting, creative learning spaces that can support a variety of programs, maker spaces for team STEAM learning, um, and improved audio, video, and internet support in our meeting room spaces and very exciting, even an auditorium in our East County Library. Um, all of this, uh, these spaces will center the library as a space for civic engagement, community entertainment, and many other programming opportunities. Adding more flexible spaces and cutting edge technology in the library buildings and operations does mean that we will need to train and reorient our current staff and add new staff to realize the full potential of these new spaces. We'll need staffing that can support new technologies and additional cultural programming. Our FY24 budget also includes a community partnerships manager, which is a new position that will be focused on developing new location-based partnerships so that community groups can begin to co-create programming in library spaces. Thanks. Um, that's exciting. And so this new position you're picturing would go out to groups and talk to them about their space needs and try to figure out if it makes sense to um, either, I mean, to open their kind of existing program to a wider community and locate it within the library or else to design, you know, new kind of events or whatever that would utilize library space. Is that yeah, absolutely. So we really envision this community partnerships manager to um, work with local organizations who have subject matter expertise and skill to help um, co-create and program in our spaces. So an example might be um, there are organizations that specialize in creative learning, right? And um, and so the library doesn't always have to be the experts on um, providing those programs. And so it's really we we um, have this opportunity with these new spaces to develop partnerships where organizations can program in those spaces. We really want to create that sort of shared ownership of the spaces so that it's not just library staff um, uh, really activating those spaces. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a follow up too? This is exciting. Um, I love the idea of our community going into our libraries and making things and recording things and um, but that's a different sort of thing than going in and picking up a book. Yeah. And as you say, you're creating or you're creating new positions, you're hiring different types of staff that have a skill set, but you're also dealing with kinds of technologies that may be unfamiliar to, I mean, so you're going to have to show people how to use this stuff and you have to maintain this stuff. So, um, it can be an expensive proposition. Um, uh, just curious that uh, these are ongoing commitments and uh, you're planning to fund these things whether they're used or not for some period of time? I think that's a really good um, question. Uh, so we are fortunate to receive um, some uh, commitment of funding from our library foundation to support 
um, the acquisition and purchase of um, some of the equipment that will be made available in particularly the maker spaces um, and our flexible um, learning spaces. And so, like anything, we will evaluate um, the the um, the use of that equipment and how our community is responding. Um, and so we've we've planned. And Katie, I don't know if you want to speak to sort of our yeah, group. sure, I can yeah. jump in a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've we've done, as, as Annie mentioned, you know, we want to make sure that we're evaluating sort of this is brand new for us, right? So uh, you know the usage, the success of this new programming. And we have in the, the fifth year of our um, district fund balance plan, we have set aside a tranche of resources to fund that initial replacement cycle for that equipment. And that point in time, we'll have sort of, you know, several years of evaluation to kind of determine, do we want to move forward with this or not? And at that point in time, we've got those one-time resources set aside at the same time, we'd be making a decision whether or not to work that into our ongoing expenses. That sounds like a great, great plan. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those uh, changes, yeah, do sound really cool and exciting. Um, this, my question, I think, falls into the can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs uh, category. And uh, while you're doing these projects and making these big changes, the uh, several libraries are now closed to the public. Um, what work are you doing to mitigate the impacts to the community, which appear to be caught by surprise about the breadth and duration of these closures? And what is in place currently and what do you have planned for the duration of the projects to help those communities? Thank you for asking that question. Um, after voters approved the library bond in November of 2020, the library and Multnomah County leadership um, agreed on fiscally responsible and aggressive bond spending deadlines to maximize taxpayer investment and to mitigate the dramatic effects of inflation and supply chain disruptions. Um, this construction schedule has disrupted some services, as you um, noted, as multiple library buildings clo um, are closing simultaneously, which you've seen with the Holgate Library. Um, to reduce the impact of these closures, the library has proactively been communicating with patrons about the closures and promoting alternate locations and services. Using an equity framework, the library has expanded staff support at open locations um, who have seen an uptick in um, activity and, and uh, patron traffic um, from the host locations. And we've also opened some temporary services to communities most impacted by the library closures. Uh, for instance, uh, down the block from Central Library in downtown Portland um, is the library's community tech space. This space offers technology access and help, including free internet and computer computer use, device charging, uh, printing, faxing, and scanning, all are, which criti are critical services that people rely on um, that don't have access to those services. Um, we also have uh, the mobile library, um, which has been an exciting addition uh, to our um, library's capacity that is currently in a semi-permanent location at a Multnomah County property, the Hanson site, which is located at 122nd and Gleason, um, right down the 122nd from Midland Library. The mobile library is providing technology support um, and access to culturally and linguistic relevant materials and more. Uh, staff at closed locations uh, have also been reassigned, some staff have been reassigned to some outreach teams in uh, each of those geographic regions where libraries are closed. That includes in uh, North Northeast with Albina and North Portland, downtown with the Central Library closure, and Mid-County um, with the closures of Holgate and Midland. These outreach teams are providing drop-in library and tech help services at community organizations, sort of meeting people uh, where they're at. And so uh, examples of partners where we're providing these services are the Chinese Language School and Rosewood Initiative, among uh, many others. The, this brief closure of several libraries at the same time is a really difficult trade-off, and we know that it's impacting our communities. But the new library spaces on their way will allow for a significant advancement in this community's ability to bring together people, information, opportunities, and resources. Thank you. Um, go, no, go ahead, Margo. Um, you mentioned, let's take the example that you gave, the mobile site mm -hmm. at 122nd and Gleason. So you have that in place. What's its usage like? I mean, are people using it? 
So we've we've done sort of a slow rollout of the mobile library. People are using it. Uh, we haven't done broad marketing yet of the mobile library because it's a brand new service that we're offering and learning how to um, implement. And so we've taken time to it. It rolled out in uh, mid April and um, open to the public. And uh, we've learned a lot about running a mobile library, including sort of the the needs around maintenance schedules and and things like that. And so we haven't broadly marketed it yet. Um, we will gradually increase our marketing to in increase access. Access. Um, so right now I would say that the usage has been relatively low um, and we'd like to increase that over the time as we've um, practiced our ability to, to provide that service from the mobile library. And could you talk a little bit more about your broad marketing? I mean, most of the marketing that the library does is at the library. I mean, you find out about classes and all sorts of stuff. With Midland being closed or Central being closed, how are you going to conduct this marketing? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. So we do have a team of our, our marketing and communications team with um, skilled social media coordinator who focuses on um, engagement through our social media channels. We also have our um, outreach teams that, of, of staff who have been reassigned uh, to those teams that are going out and connecting with um, community organizations, including public schools and other public agencies to be able to market through word of mouth. Because we also understand that word of mouth connection and relationship is really key and important important inviting people to services. Okay. You're welcome. That's a good segue to our next question about uh, community engagement throughout the bond projects. Um, at this hearing last year, I had just voted on which color, you know, which design scheme I liked for the whole gate library. Um, so uh, we're curious to hear a little bit more about that process. Are you getting the level of response that you had hoped for? Uh, and which engagement techniques have been most effective uh, and which techniques are not working? So the creation of the library capital bond uh, programs community engagement at ethos guides each of the nine major projects with the spirit of the community being in the room for key design decision points the design teams use a variety of community engagement channels to amplify the voices of those most often underrepresented by government education and other organizations community engagement channels currently include um, public community meetings both virtual and in person tabling and outreach at community events, paid community engagement programs, which I'll speak to in a moment, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews, asynchronous opportunities, such as the voting opportunities, um, and public surveys. Engagement for the chapter, chapter one projects, which are Holgate, Midland, Albina, and North Portland, met and exceeded the library's commitment to community engagement. While online meetings were sparsely attended, um, and not a productive technique to deeply engage uh, community members, turnout for public events at libraries, farmers markets, community celebrations have proved to be an excellent way to grow awareness of the project and ask specific questions for direction and preference. Team members are out in the community um, at, at the 21st annual Autism Walk, for example, Hacienda CDC Food Pantry, Dishman Community Center, and dozens of other community gathering points. The library is providing public voting options, as you mentioned, on a variety of top, op topics as well um, for each of the projects. Three techniques um, I wanna highlight really stand out um, in our first set of projects. First um, is the paid community engagement prog programs across all four projects. Um, these brought grassroots community organizers of all ages close to the design process. From community design advocates holding focus groups within their communities to teens participating in the youth opportunity design approach or yoda as we called it um, <laughs> offering paid opportunities to the community really provides respect dignity and a value of time to folks who are often left out due to transportation child care and other barriers to participation some of the deepest insights and solutions came from these groups um, and community members and are by far uh, our most popular speakers at our groundbreaking projects as well. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, groundbreaking ceremonies. Compensated community design team members are surveyed annually also on their satisfaction with the program so that we can learn from and evolve um, those programs as we go. Another standout uh, impact of community engagement is the lasting impression community members are making in our buildings through art. Community art workshops hosted by the uh, RAC, Regional Art and Culture Council, artists and architects invited the public to share of themselves, their culture and creativity to inspire the artwork that each building will include. 
These workshops provide a hands-on contribution while offering the community the experience of being part of the collaborative art installation. Community art is a, is a vital aspect of many of the library projects, and for participants, it's a tangible touch point and imprint of themselves as part of the final buildings. The third uh, engagement feature that I'll mention is our uh, broad engagement technique that brought out thousands of community members' opinions uh, through the public voting um, offered in the Chapter 1 projects. Voting on themes and colorways for interiors and exteriors has uh, turned out to be a really extraordinarily popular and fairly easy to manage way to gather input into the design. <laughs> Um, this process gives community members both insight into the design process and a chance to offer their opinion on the look and feel of library buildings. The team will continue to look for additional public voting opportunities on remaining projects. The East County Library project is deep into community engagement, and while the project team is utilizing those established methods that I mentioned earlier, they're also experiment, experimenting with additional outreach through media ads, as well as expansive outreach work with established community organizations in East County through a paid library champions program. Engagement planning for the final projects, which are uh, Northwest Library, St. John's, and Belmont, is underway. Many themes have emerged across our communities that speak to a common desire, one of connection. Uh, people have shared that they want to, a place to cook food, um, to share food, to share cultural recipes, a place to make art and music, a place to gather with others and from each other, and a place to be with nature. Um, in all of these spaces, our community is asking for space to connect. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, a place to connect with others and with themselves. And, is, and this is resulting directly in amenities um, offered in our buildings, some of which I mentioned earlier around flexible uh, spaces, but also outdoor courtyards, reading gardens, gathering circles, and flexible civic plazas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't want to do the volume? No. I think I got it. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> so there's a lot of change going on at the libraries and uh, watching this with great interest because I'm a daily user um, and I'm a, a I, you're a democracy nerd, I'm a book nerd, I'm a daily reader too. So I'm a little concerned when I start hearing you talking about, you know, more effort, more money, more uh, energy being put into these new ideas, which are wonderful and exciting, but unproven. And what about the books? You know, are we going to get the latest and the greatest of the books? And and uh, so I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who's expressing that kind of concern. And so my question has to do with um, what is your response to the folks who who, who share that concern, and um, and who may be questioning the current direction that you're taking. I'm glad you asked that question because it gives us an opportunity to share that we haven't forgotten the books. They're still really important. <laughs> I have multiple books going all at once, and so I am too a daily, uh, you know, reader. So um, let me share sort of our approach and and uh, to clarify some sort of. Uh, questions that have come up and concerns uh, around sort of book access. So even before the pandemic completely altered how we all lived and accessed resources, the library was really changing to meet modern needs. We've continued to invest in, in both print and digital collections and tailor our services to meet accelerated needs for resources in multiple languages, new technologies, and diverse programming. Circulation of digital materials has been increasing at an incredible weight rate. I'm going to share a few numbers, which I always make my eyes <laughs> larger. Um, so digital checkouts now represent 61% of Multnomah County Library's overall circulation. That's been an incredible transformation over the past 10 years. Um, in fact, over the past 10 years, digital checkouts have increased more than 900%. It's significant. But the good news um, is that with these new spaces, we're actually not reducing the overall size of our printed materials collection that is available for circulation. This is a common misunderstanding. Uh, libraries will continue to provide books and other physical materials, and the number is not decreasing. What is changing, though, is the way that we provide access to those materials. So uh, part of the Library Capital Bond Program includes the creation of a new centralized operations center 
Um, that centralized operations center means that we can store and circulate thousands of materials directly from that one building, rather than manually packing and processing items by hand from branch to branch to eventually be picked up by a patron. For decades, the library has used to um, had to use our largest location central library as expensive storage space to accommodate items that can't fit in other branches, meaning that the item, many of the items on central library shelves don't get checked out by patrons at that branch, but they get sent out to uh, patrons who put those on hold um, and request them from other locations. With the centralization of some collections across the library system at the operations center, including from Central Library, we're making space for tailored, culturally re relevant collections informed by the neighborhoods in, at, of those libraries. The library will be using circulation data and other measures to ensure that the vast majority of materials that are moved from Central Library to the operations center are those that haven't been checked out in more than two years. Perhaps most importantly, the shifts in how we distribute the library's collection allows for the creation of valuable community space that we spoke to earlier that can be used for conversing, learning, creating, and simply being or reading a book. Uh, the libraries are for everyone, um, and these new spaces really demonstrate that value. So my middle son is a union carpenter, and he's actually working on the operations building. Very exciting. Yeah, I think that's coming. He's getting ready to move on to a new project. Um, so is the operation, is that going to be a place that if I wanted to get something that is brand new, you've got it rather than putting a hold on it, waiting a week or whatever. So it comes to my Hollywood branch. I can just go to the operations facility and get it. So that building, that building will not um, have a public facing library uh, where you can check out materials. It will have our friends at the library will be hosting having a bookstore um, at that site. Uh, but the good thing about the operations center is, although it will store um, those materials with the efficiencies created by automated materials handling, the duration of time that you wait after you've put that book on hold will will reduce. So it's really going to increase our efficiency because there's far less manual handling of that item. As I said, you know, right now we so many items come from, for example, Central Library, where it's manually pulled from the shelf by a staff person who dip, 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 many hands brings it to, you know, Hollywood Library, that really um, increases the efficiency, the, the new um, system at the Operations Center. I, I understand. Now, thank you. Um, last question for me. Um, Tidal Wave, mm -hmm. that used to be a resource in my community that I used frequently because I, you know, like to own books as well as read books. Um, and that shut down. So are there plans to open something Tidal Wave-like? And also, are you going to start accepting donations of books again? Uh or is so, that um, happening? Yeah, so the operations center, as I mentioned, our friends of the library ran the, the Tidal Wave uh, location. And so we will they will have a bookstore front um, that is like Tidal Wave at the new operations center at 122nd in Gleason. Additionally, they will, um, our plans are in, uh, underway for sort of uh, access to purchase materials from the Friends of the Library at the East County Library, likely through some type of a kiosk um, where you could purchase materials as well. And then in regard to donations, I actually, um, I can't answer your question offhand because I don't know what the current status of our accepting of donations is, and I don't want to give you inaccurate information, but I'd be happy to follow up. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we've been talking about bright, shiny new bricks and mortar, so let's get to something a little more mundane like dollars and cents. Um, we spent some time last year talking about your accumulating fund balance and your plan to use that to deal with, you know, your structural deficit in the out years. But that that's all on the on the money inside. Let's talk about the money outside, your expense level. Um, what about um, expenses and increased staffing? I mean, I see you're adding some additional staff. You've been doing a lot more community engagement. What work does the library do to explore efficiencies, operational efficiencies? We'll get to the bond efficiencies in a minute. In a minute but what work is the library doing to contain costs at the operational level? And can you give us some examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, like any other industry, library services are evolving and they're responding to community needs and the changing world that we live in. But but as we're evolving, we are certainly sort of keeping an eye on the, you know, our efficiency and sort of our long-term fiscal health as part of that. And I'll I'll run through a couple of examples of that work. 
Uh, with the construction of new spaces, we're, we're taking both the, the time and the opportunity to really re-examine our current staffing models to assess what our staffing needs are going to be uh, in our newer buildings. Are, you know, they're going to be different than our different types of spaces. So rather than just simply replicating and expanding our current model, we're, we're taking that time to sort of reassess it and build specifically for our future footprint. Uh, and even prior to the library bond projects, you know, just in terms of you know, operational efficiencies. Library leadership has had a practice for, for many years of reviewing all vacancies as they arise to make sure that the skill sets and roles that we have are well aligned with our organizational priorities like as they evolve. Um, so, so rather than just filling each vacancy as is when it comes up, uh, we you know, stop, pause, and, and take a look across the, the, the entire system to see if there's a, a higher priority need where we should apply that capacity. So that's a regular practice that we have. Another area uh, where we would highlight good stewardship of, of taxpayer dollars is through um, what we consider to be really excellent ongoing and maintenance of our existing infra infrastructure. Uh, every year we, we allocate funds to keep library buildings updated and maintained well. Um, and we're gonna absolutely make sure that we continue to support right size annual maintenance and capital budgets um, as we move forward. We also have plans in the coming year to start really detailed um, facilities condition assessments of, of our older buildings that are not major bond locations. Um, and, and these are efforts that, that we're focused on because they, they help avoid increased costs resulting from deferred maintenance um, and really help ensure the longevity of, of our building assets. And so that's another area where we focus on maintaining um, operational efficiencies. Um, in the last several years, we've also centralized some of our purchasing efforts um, so that really common supplies ordering and delivery is handled centrally rather than by each individual li library location kind of ordering their supplies and things like that. So that's a, a smaller example, but a way that we've tried to achieve a, you know, higher operational efficiency. Um, and as Annie discussed earlier, um, we're in the process of, of centralizing some of our services with the opening of the new operations center. Um, the, this work is really expected to increase um, efficiency in our materials movement and in our storage costs. And we're really excited about that. Um, and just kind of operationally speaking, that location is gonna be easier to access mid and east county locations where we provide many of our services. Uh, you know, and one thing that Annie touched on a little bit earlier is, is the um, the way that historically, like the lack of physical space that we have has created what we would call kind of inefficiencies that we're now able to, to correct in some ways. And so, you know, kind of out of necessity over the years, we've, you know, accrued additional outreach costs to make sure that those services that couldn't happen in our library locations were able to still happen through external partnerships or through community partnerships, things like that. Um, and now that we have this opportunity to bring some of those services back in our library buildings, um, we're really excited about that, both as a, a benefit to patrons, um, but also as a more efficient use of library resources. Uh, and I'll just close here by saying that, that you know, the library has been and, and will continue to be um, very judicious about where and when we add ongoing costs. So every year we have a conversation about how to how to maintain that balance between our ongoing revenues and our ongoing expenses over a pretty long time horizon. Um, and, and we exercise a lot of caution before we increase our ongoing expense um, trend line because we're we're very aware of that in the out years. And in the past, you know, when we've seen those lines start to creep together a little bit, um, we have implemented constraint budgets in the past, and, and we're likely to, at some point in the future, explore constraint budgets again. Thank you. I have a couple of follow-up questions. The first one is to your very last remarks about the close, the closing lines. We see the county's uh, five-year uh, general fund forecasts regularly, but not so much for the library. Can you tell me where that crossing line point is now in your forecasting? What I can tell you is that the, the current 10 year forecast that we have right now um, shows that we can maintain our current service levels still holding at that $1.22 rate uh, over those 10 years. Uh, without sort of so those lines are going to cross for the next 10 years but what is also true is that we are in the midst of a massive transformation right and that forecast is based off of uh, how we currently operate and so we are in really close collaboration with jeff and with our our partners in you know dca all across the board to try to forecast and assess 
what are our future costs going to be when we have larger buildings, but they're younger average age, you know, we're making these big investments in technology. What is that going to mean for our internal service rates going forward? So, uh, I would say that right now the forecast looks great, but we don't have full information sort of informing that long-term expense trend. And that was my second question, <laughs> which is, okay, so you're 10 years out, you're not quite crossing under the old operations model. We heard some examples of how the bond projects are creating some efficiencies, which sound like that's a good check on the cost containment side. But also, the future of the library sounds like you will need to uh, either train up your existing staff for new skills or potentially exchange current staff skill sets for entirely new types of staff with different types of skills. What is, how does that? look in your future cost picture. Yeah, I would say that that is work that is well underway right now. We have a number of workshops over this summer to kind of get the right people in the room and, and figure out, you know, exactly what um, both total numbers of staff, but also what, what, you know, job classifications, what skill sets do we need, you know, in these future spaces. And so I, I would just say that that work is underway right now and that we, we don't know exactly. We think there are going to be opportunities to, um, you know, take existing staff and like reallocate, like upskill basically, and have them serve that future need. Um, there may be other cases where we're just adding additional staff to meet a, a skill set that we we don't have currently. Dramatically shifting gears now. <laughs> um, as I uh, as we put together these questions and as I've just heard the dialogue um, this morning, I'm I, I've been thinking a lot. Um, my, my partner and I last summer, actually pretty soon after we had this hearing last year, we had the amazing opportunity to spend the summer basically uh, biking across the country um, and spent 93 days or something like largely living outside. I mean, obviously there's you know, a huge amount of you know, privilege in what we were able to do, um, but also we shared some experiences like difficulty finding an air conditioned public space or, you know, the ability to use the restroom or water, which is certainly not like guaranteed in so many places um, and communities. And it, you know, really just made me appreciate and think about the unique role that libraries have in our you know, uh, our social safety net and our social like, services such as as they are, if you can call that a net. Um, but so anyway, just thinking about the different like profile of folks who use um, the library system and county services. Um, we talked last year about the library's partnership with the Multnomah County Health Department and specifically the Behavioral Health Unit um, to ensure that there were kind of connections for um, library patrons who were in need um, to county services. And we, we hoped we could get an update on that, how, you know, if that partnership is still in process, how it's been working and what you see for the future of that. Sure. Thank you for that question. And I just, I briefly want to comment and, and just agree wholeheartedly about the critical role libraries about, you know, play in providing that just basic needs access in terms of restrooms, water, and um, we've seen with the closure of Central Library, obviously that's having an impact in that downtown um, area and our community tech space. I mean, we actually haven't broadly marketed that community tech space because we really wanted to rely on really serving that downtown community and they see many days where they're at capacity, um, you know, in terms of that need, not only for digital access, but that restroom and, and water access. So. Uh, I, I'll, so in regard to the question regarding um, conversations with behavioral health services, we've had conversations with behavioral health uh, to figure out how and where they can bring their services to people in the library. Those conversations are still in progress as our current uh, cramped spaces and closed locations make it difficult to accommodate um, these res new resources in a substantive way. But we do expect that with our new, more flexible spaces, we'll have better opportunities for partnership. We recognize that a lot of people that are served uh, via the health department and particularly through behavioral health are also patrons that we see in our libraries. Uh, we'll continue, uh, particularly, I'm excuse me, we'll continue to explore how we can connect and support more behavioral health expertise in library spaces. Um, and thus far, our um, health colleagues have been receptive about working together. I want to highlight, though, a um, development over the past year. We have a contract with 
um, an ongoing contract with Cascadia Behavioral Health Unit. Um, and we've really had great success in having community resource counselors at Central Library, as well as guidance for our um, other library locations. We also have um, been in conversations with other library systems about their use of peer support navigators. And uh, we're beginning to research what that might like, look like in our library system as well. We, uh, we also continue to provide appropriate training for our library staff to help patrons that may need additional support using the library or locating appropriate services. Um, however, I will say that, you know, we know that library staff are limited in what they can provide in terms of mental health services, of course. Um, and we know it's critically important um, that we continue to advance partnerships with agencies and departments that do have um, this expertise um, and resources. Thank you. So um, my question, I guess we'll give you an opportunity to think broadly about the future of libraries. So what do you see as the biggest challenges on the horizon for libraries? And if you want also the, the biggest opportunities for libraries. Really good question. And I appreciate the opportunity to you know speak broadly to this because it's a really important um, part of our future planning. So um, I would say the risk of overstating it, the public library is changing and evolving. I think we've used the word transformation several times during this uh, discussion. While that has been happening for a while, new library spaces will transform how we use and think about an institution that's largely been serving people in the same way for more than 150 years. It's very exciting, but it will be a challenge and take time for some to experience a new way of using and understanding the library. Another challenge facing libraries is identifying the ways in which the library can adequately meet social safety and service needs as we see. We, we, we manage those challenges on a day-to-day -day basis in our locations. As was discussed earlier, establishing and maintaining partnerships with medical and mental health professionals will be critical to the sustainability of providing these kinds of support. We also know that this transformation is essential, not just for our own Multnomah County community, but also as a signal to communities across the country, challenging the value and role of libraries. It's really painful to watch as other library systems, including here in Oregon, face escalated threats of censorship, defunding and book banning, a fight that has turned beloved community institutions into bargaining chips and of social and political discourse. We're fortunate and we're grateful to Multnomah County for supporting its libraries, and we will continue to honor the trust and investment of residents and patrons by providing library resources and services that meet the needs of the community. Um, no, I'm going to pass. Okay, <laughs> we have one more question. It's pretty specific. Uh, it was our ask only if time question. So uh, we see there is a $1.4 million um, in the fiscal year 24 approved budget dedicated for special projects that will be placed in a special sub fund at the county, uh, specifically for navigating temporary space, technology, and other needs arising from the uh, capital bond program. Um, are those, is the bond unable to pay uh, for those costs or were they new or unanticipated? And will this be needed for the next several years to meet costs outside the bond? Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah. We do have a, a handful of projects next fiscal year that are included in on the county budget side uh, in a new program offer called Library Special Projects. Uh, in fiscal year 2024, these projects are largely geared towards addressing the library's operational needs resulting from the bond work. And so very, very distinct from construction, from, you know, sort of the work of the bond team. It's more on the operational needs of the library side. Um, and just a note for, for future conversations that we'll have about this, um, that program offer is really designed to be um, a vehicle to, to express how we intend to use our one-time fund balance resources. So over the next coming fiscal year, it's almost entirely related to operational needs resulting from the bond. In five years from now, you would probably see in that program offer for those resources that we talked about for um, the basically replacement cycle of that equipment and technology, things like that. So it's more of a vehicle than specifically tied to, you know, this is related to, to temporary needs for the bond. Um, an, an example of some of that 
you know, sort of operational need resulting from the bond uh, is the continuity of library services project, which, and Annie's talked about that a fair amount, but it's, it's really all about mitigating service level impacts in the community during these temporary bond closures. So we're setting up community technology spaces. We have a semi-permanent location for the mobile library. Um, and there, there are hard costs that are associated with that operational work that, that really were not envisioned as part of the voter approved bond. You know, the bond team is focused on making sure that those bond resources are fully dedicated to the work of modernizing our buildings, you know, making big technology investments. And, and we as the library are focusing some of our one-time resources on meeting the operational needs of that transition. Uh, another example of a project that's in that program offer um, is a pilot for staff technology. So from um, communications equipment to mobile uh, computing solutions, we're using district funds for this work because it's staff facing, right? And the, and the bond projects are really focused on community facing investments to the library and system overall. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that, that these are not actually new or unanticipated costs. This is this is work that we've been planning for well over probably a year and a half. Um, and funding for these projects was included in the fiscal year 2023 library district budget. Um, the biggest change is that we're budgeting for those temporary services, spaces, and technology as part of the county library budget as a standalone program offer, specifically because we think it's going to help with um, overall communication and transparency around that work. We just have more narrative and, and, and focus on the county library side when it comes to talking about outcomes and, 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 and projects. Thanks for the clarity. Clear definitions help us in our work as well. Um, I think that wrapped any other follow-ups? No? Okay. Thank you so much for your thoughtful responses. This is, I think, one of our favorite. We just love to hear about the library. Um, so I will um, officially close the hearing and then open a regular business meeting of the TSCC. Commissioners, do you have any additional comments on the budget? Allegra, can you provide the staff recommendation for the certification letter? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, I did want to take a moment to welcome Katie to first year with the library. Is that right? Okay. Um, she has jumped in and done a fantastic job. Uh, all library staff take a very thoughtful approach to their work, and it shows in their budget and the budget process. We so appreciate the very quick responses and outreach on budget issues throughout the year. So, um, for the fiscal year 23-24 approved budget, TSCC staff found the budget estimates to be reasonable for the purposes stated and the budget to be in substantial compliance with budget law. TSCC staff have no recommendations or objections to the budget. Thank you. May I have a motion authorizing the commission to sign the certification letter as recommended? I would be proud to. to be, so. <laughs> Great. Second. Great. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, the Multnomah County Library District uh, budget is certified by the TSCC. Thank you so much, and I will adjourn our regular meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.